Um, hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to Bars for organizing this panel and to Fran for inviting me to be part of it. Um, so today I will be talking briefly about the afterlives of 19th century portraits of Toussaint Louverture, the famous leader of the Haitian Revolution, during the 20th century, specifically in stamps, coins and notes. Oh. Um, and as some of you may know, Louverture's likeness has always been a contentious issue. And we do not really have any representations of him with a very reliable claim to veracity. To this is added the tension that comes from the fact that any of the images that we do have are strongly tinted by political issues, be them the political tensions between European countries, racial thinking or romantic conventions regarding portraiture of black individuals. So this has made the topic of Louverture's image a really rich and complex subject from the beginning. So by the time we reach the 20th century, um, there are a number of traditions of Toussaint's likeness being drawn from in every single representation that we see. Um, because of this, I'd like to begin by describing briefly some of the main traditions of portraits that we have of Toussaint before going into how these have been used in stamps, coins and notes. So by the year of his death in 1803, Toussaint was a celebrity whose image and biography were being published around Europe in several languages. In 1819, Pamphile Delacroix um, very rightly wrote, quote, Toussaint Louverture has been successively depicted as a ferocious beast or the best of men, as an execrable monster or a martyred saint, end of quote. Delacroix's statement speaks to the fact that Toussaint's image was widely used for different political ends in Europe, with his detractors and supporters switching sides and presenting him as a hero, poster child for British abolitionism, a duplicitous black man, etc. etc. Um, so I do not really have time to go uh, into detail about his different representations in image and text today, but I'd like to briefly introduce some of the main traditions that have influenced representations of Toussaint in the 20th century. One of the first um, engravings, and let me see if I can move my, oh, one of the first engravings, <laughs> um, uh, that we have of Toussaint is by J. Barlow following um, the description of Marcus Rainsford, who had met Louverture as a prisoner in Saint-Domingue. So Rainsford described him positively as a person of, quote, manly appearance to which age is about to give a venerable aspect. His countenance is remarkably striking, but full of the most prepossessing suavity. He is a perfect black and such a description of figure as might be supposed that to be that of a sable Mars. End of quote. So um, from this and other descriptions and drawings that Rainsford had, Barlow created this image that we see here, which while having a claim to veracity in the sense that Rainsford had seen uh, Louverture in person, also is clearly affected by political ideas. Um, here we see, for instance, Louverture wearing something much more akin to a British West Indian uniform than a French one, highlighting the British view of him as an ally against France. The most um, reproduced image of Louverture is Morin's 1832 profile, which scholars have considered often a racist caricature because of its very strong facial features, protruding lips and slightly open mouth. It has some claim to veracity in that it is supposedly based on an image presented by Toussaint himself to uh, Room Saint Laurent um, in 1801, and I, you know, my French is terrible. Um, so this is not totally implausible that this image was presented by Toussaint um, and that he might have looked a bit like this, considering Toussaint had lost his upper teeth when hit by a cannonball um, in his youth, although the image might be exaggerating features to fit racist stereotypes. Moreover, this image seems to also fit the physical description of Louverture by Napoleon's aide-de-camp Caffarelli, 
who visited Louverture in jail when he was close to his death and described him as a diminished, ill and undignified, small, thin and ugly man. Quote, his large eyes sunk in their sockets, but still alert and piercing, pronounced cheekbones, hollow cheeks, a wide but relatively long nose, a large mouth, but no upper, no teeth on the upper jaw and the lower jaw thrust forward with long protruding teeth, end of quote. So while this is the description of an ill and dying man, and we cannot know how much Caffarelli's negative view is colored by his own racism and the fact that he's describing an enemy, um, it is not miles away from the image by Moran that we see here. And while this could be seen as a negative image, it has in fact repeatedly been used up to the 20th and 21st century in contexts that praise L'Overture, um, as it was also used as, as a frontispiece in biographies that presented him in a positive light during the 19th century. Um, a, and I'm gonna move this here. Um, a variation of this is the equestrian portrait uh, by Bolosan. Although the link between these two images is not clear historically, and I cannot go into this right now because of reasons of time. However, it is notable how this image clearly presents L'Overture as a type of black Napoleon, similar to Napoleon's equestrian portrait by Jacques-Louis David, um, although it might have predated it. And then another variation of Moran exists by Le Belletier de Saint-Rémy, made in 1853, who altered Moran's portrait for the publication of L'Overture's memoirs, closing the mouth and softening the features. And in fact, it seems to me that this is the version of Moran's image that is most used today. Um, and finally, um, and I will move myself back here again. Um, finally, there's another image with a claim to veracity that we see here. This engraving of a younger L'Overture, which is not entirely at odds with Moran's. You know, we have a longish nose, a pointy chin, um, which was used by Grignon Lacoste in his biography of Toussaint, where he claimed it was, it was copied from an engraving owned by the L'Overture family. Um, originally made by the military engineer Montfayon, presented to Toussaint's son Isaac L'Overture in 1818, this image is said to be the only one that Isaac thought was the true likeness of his father. People have often interpreted this to whiten Toussaint, um, with its kind of more angular features um, or sh kind of pointier features. Um, and it is also a younger Toussaint, which would make sense considering Isaac saw his father for the last time when he was a child. So these historical representations, as well as this 1940s painting by Enrique Caravia that we see in the middle, um, and which is clearly based on these three engravings, um, are what conforms the basis of images of L'Overture that we have today. However, there are many other historical images of L'Overture, but these are the ones that have had like a longer afterlife um, and that are kind of summarized in this Caravia painting. Um, so now I'd like to focus on some stamps, notes and coins to argue as Rento and Brun suggest that, quote, their reading as political, sociocultural, and territorially specific texts offer valuable insights into the evolution and outlook of the issuing state and the imagined community within its boundaries." End of quote. So basically, what do these stamps, coins, and notes tell us about the self-image of, you know, this imagined community that these, um, these objects are producing? Um, and as David Geges suggests, quote, Lower Tour's elusive character and the extremes of historical interpretation it has inspired are mirrored in the diversity of pictorial representations that have appeared in print and canvas since 1802. So I will work with some images from Haiti, as well as stamps from Benin um, and from Cuba, trying to reflect on the view of L'Overture that they reflect both within Haiti and in his role in the larger African and revolutionary imaginary of the 20th century. So this first stamp that we have here, for example, from 1904, is clearly based on the 
um, Morin's reformed 1853 engraving, although it has altered the facial traits very clearly, extending the nose and bringing back the jawline. Surrounded by Europeanized allegorical figures, the image presents a lower tour that is eminently French, even giving him white hair, you know, maybe an 18th century wig, which he doesn't really have in the original. In some ways, if it wasn't for the writing on the sides that states the name, this would not necessarily be a lower tour distinguishable from any other French figure of the period. In the next 1954 stamp, also still we also still see him, based on the Moran um, engraving, presenting the French bicorn, which he also had in the other stamp. Um, although now his hair is brown and the surrounding European allegorical imagery has been stripped away. I believe this is in line with a move through these official images towards reducing the Frenchness of Toussaint in some Haitian repre representations over time. Another interesting use of the Moran engraving appears in this 2003 stamp, where we see the reformed Moran face merge with Louverture's equestrian drawing by Volosan. But here the Volosan image has suffered a number of transformations. So the background, on the one hand, is less visibly tropical, the stamp has lost the palm tree and presents rather a river and people, maybe workers, I don't know if you can see, uh, maybe soldiers, by the water, highlighting Toussaint's role of leadership of the people rather than him alone as a military figure in the Volosan um, eh, drawing. Another clear change is how combative the Volosan image is compared to the stamp. Louverture's sword is now hanging by his side rather than being ready to attack, uh, in what turns out to be a weirdly kind of static image of a rider. This representation of Louverture, more as a passive and sometimes a diplomatic rather than combative manufaction, runs through the Haitian representations in the 20th century. This also reflects the fact that historically the centrality of Toussaint has been questioned and rethought by different Haitian revolution historians, and this rethinking of his own role um, is represented in this images. Similar to the Haitian figures, some other representations from around the world highlight this view of Louverture as a statesman more than a military general. So here, reading a declaration in a copy of the Caravia painting, um, and the declaration aspect probably coming from the Barlow print originally, um, we see him as a manly intellectual figure, figure in these Benin stamps which also add a new layer to the narrative. So at the bottom, if you can see, the stamp declares that Louverture was a descendant of the kings of Alada in Dahomey, adding to the Caravia image a narrative directly related to the descriptions of Louverture in the 19th century. Through this text, the stamp creates a link between Benin and Louverture, adding a new layer by making him a statesman like his ancestors. So this claim about the ancestors is based um, on the fact that Toussaint's son Isaac said in his memoirs, memoirs that Louverture was the grandson of Gao Guinou, um, whose second son was sold to slavery. From this text, a number of different myths of Louverture's origin have grown, uh, making him sometimes the son of a king who was enslaved himself, um, etc., etc. But according to Gegas, Gaou might have actually meant a military commander in 1720s Dahomey rather than a king. Regardless of that, the underlying link um, with an important figure from Benin persists. Contra um, contradictorily, however, this narrative layer also brings forth some of the discourses used to discredit the Haitian Revolution as a whole, by presenting Louverture as an exceptional man whose talents were not really representative of the Haitian population that he was a leader of. So he was, you know, so amazing as he was because he was actually from royal blood rather than him being like every other person who lived in Haiti. Um, even more bizarre is the representation of Toussaint by the Cuban government in 1991 in this stamp. So. A mix of the Caravia and Moran image, the Cuban government opted to, opted to sharpen even further the facial features and returning him his French bicorn, presenting uh, what seems to me a Europeanized representation of L'Overture. The Cuban stamp 
also provides a frame with the French revolutionary colors rather than the Haitian colors, linking him with the French revolutionary tradition much more clearly. So now to close, I would just like to finish addressing two Haitian notes. Um, the first one that I'd like to show you is the one Gour note that circulated in the 80s in Haiti. Um, so this one, like the previous stamp from the Nin, is based on the Carabia painting. Interestingly, this is a further aged version of Carabia's Toussaint, keeping with the Carabia uniform, which is inspired on the Montfayon print, so the one of the young Toussaint that I showed you last um, at the beginning. Um, and making the facial features slightly stronger and maybe more masculine, dare I say, possibly um, as an influence coming from the Barlow print. So this note represents a mature version of Haiti as a country. This is a diplomatic, presidential-looking lower tour, um, not a fighter on a horse with a sword. He's not wearing the bicorn, so the military associations come from the uniform only, which you cannot really see that much. And on the reverse of the note, we see the arms stationary rather than in combat below l'Union fait la force. Um, and I believe this is um, a decidedly less revolutionary lower tour, providing a more kind of settled self-image of Haiti at the time. This more aged and more masculine and mature looking Toussaint is quite different from the one present in the next note that I would like to show you. This one, um, which returns to the Montfayon print much more faithfully. So celebrating the bicentenary of the Haitian constitution in 1801, it presents a young looking lover tour, which would not really have been the case at the time of the publication of the constitution. So it's a kind of interesting choice to go for a young lover tour when you're celebrating the 1801 constitution. With a longer nose and fuller lips, as well as some elements of the Caravia painting uniform, this representation of Toussaint seems very realistic, but also looks like someone quite different from the ones we saw before, really. Both of these notes have some salient shared characteristics, however. Um, so we do not see here Lover Tour wearing the typically French bicorn, underplaying his relationship with France, which was very much a contentious issue during Lover Tour's life and also has been for historians of Haiti. Um, they have also both abandoned what is, in my opinion, the infamous mustache of the Caravia painting. Um, and what is interesting to me, moreover, is how the different characteristics of the historical descriptions and images start merging together, um, creating this abstract figure of Louverture that seems to now be part of his official image. Um, so in them, we are getting a Toussaint with a receding hairline, high cheekbones, rather hollow cheeks, somewhat protruding lips, although the protruding lower jaw of both Caffarelli and Moran's representations is now much more kind of realistic a closed mouth, an occasional mustache, um, and, an, and a uniform based on the Montfayon image with the stars across the chest. So this is kind of an abstract composition of Toussaint's appearance in the hopes of pinning down his elusive likeness. Um, and to close, I would just like to dedicate a minute to reflecting on the larger significance of this difficulty to pin down Louverture's image. This phenomenon, I believe, is colored by tensions in the representation of Louverture in the 19th century itself. Louverture is a freed black man who enters the scene of history, kind of demanding representation, but equally is problematic for European portrayals, not only because they might not have seen him before, um, the people who were making the drawings, um, but also because he challenges preconceptions of how an enslaved and now freed subject should be represented. As Rosenthal and Lugo Ortiz remind us, quote, not incidentally, permission to leave the premises of the plantation involved not just a written document stating such a license, but also an ekphrastic act of verbal portraiture, end of quote. In this sense, across the Americans, portraiture of enslaved people was directly related to the realities of captivity. Toussaint's many faces and the absence of a determined face in some way speak to his freedom. Towards the end of his life and around the time of the Leclerc expedition, in the words of Helen Weston, Louverture's, quote, defiance 
took the form of deliberately slipping in and out of different identities, of dissimulating, pretending, in order to survive. End of quote. Meanwhile, his becoming this set of abstract features in the 20th century is a strange form of negotiating both, uh, both offering him the subjectivity given by portraiture, while reaffirming the inability to pin Louverture down, to define him, and to trap him in an image, an expression of Louverture's fugitivity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valentina. That was super excellent. I really like the last slide. Possibly we could go back to it later during the Q&A session. So we move on to the second speaker of the, the session now. And there we go. So the second speaker is Dr. Rita Dashwood, who is the postdoctoral research associate in the Reading Communities and Cultural Formation in the 18th Century Atlantic Project at the University of, of Liverpool. Rita is an expert in 18th and 19th century studies, and her research focuses particularly on gender, property, and economics. Additional research interests include children's and young adult literature and popular culture. Her work has been published in, among others, the Journal for 18th Century Studies and 19th Century Studies. Rita was the recipient of the British, British Society for 18th Century Studies President's Prize, and her first book is Women and Property Ownership in Jane Austen. That was published last year. Uh, Rita also runs uh, her own YouTube channel, which you can see, you can find that here in the slide, the bottom. Uh, address. And um, in this YouTube channel, uh, Rita, in, in she shares her love of reading and, of course, all things Austin. So thank you very much, Rita, and it's you next. Thank you so much for that, Francesca. Can everyone hear me okay? I can, perfectly well. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so when we think of Jane Austen, we usually, usually visualize the incomplete portrait her sister drew of her, the one her family commissioned after her death, or perhaps her new statue in Basingstoke. To these more traditional portraits of Austen, however, have been added in the last few years, more unexpected and unconventional ones by contemporary artists. What would Austen look like, for example, reimagined as a witch, an action figure, or as a Star Wars Jedi guardian? What can these different portraits tell us about the ways in which we are reimagining Austen today? Unfortunately for us Austen fans, she's the only member in her family, apart from her brother George, who wasn't raised with the other siblings, to have had no formal portrait in her lifetime. The only portrait of hers drawn during her lifetime was a small pencil and watercolor sketch, which you can see here, made by her sister and closest friend, Cassandra, completed around 1810. So small, in fact, that even though years ago when I visited the National Portrait Gallery, especially to see it, I walked past it without noticing it at first. It didn't become a favorite amongst the Austen family and it was considered inadequate and unflattering by those who had known her in life. When he was about to publish his 1869 A Memoir of Jane Austen, the first full biography of Austen, her nephew Edward Austen Lee sent Cassandra's sketch to an artist, James Andrews of Maidenhead, and it served as inspiration for a watercolor he made of the author. This would later form the basis of a print engraved from the frontispiece of the biography made by William Home Lizards. While certainly lacking the incompleteness of Cassandra's sketch, this watercolor and the subsequent engraving have been much criticized for softening Austen. The Austen we see through Cassandra's eyes stares sternly away from us, her focused eyes combined with her crossed arms depicting her as sure of herself, willful and tough. The fact that this portrait was, done, was drawn in life by the person who knew her the best out of all others says much, 
Cassandra clearly saw her sister as a confident, defiant person. This fierceness is lost in the other two portraits. Here, Austin is staring blankly into space and the defiance in her stare is missing, as is the disruptive potential of her stance with her arms crossed. While having the advantage of offering us a much more complete picture of what Austin might have looked like over Cassandra's portrait, it matches the portrait Edward attempted to offer of his dear Aunt Jane, of a perfectly conventional woman devoted to domestic life above all and who cared nothing about money and fame. In attempting to present a version of Austen to the public that removed any possibility of scandal due to her status as an unmarried woman who wrote professionally, Edward offered us a version of Austen that was completely fabricated, one that is in no way supported by the image of Austen we get from her own letters or from those by people who knew her. Jump 185 years after her death, and in 2001, a new Austin portrait is commissioned for the Jane Austen Center in Bath from a perhaps more unlikely artist, Melissa Drain, trained as a portrait painter by the Royal Academy Schools in London and a police forensic artist by the FBI in Washington in the US. Drink aimed to give us a younger Austin, the one depicted by Cassandra would have been around 35, and the challenge she was presented with was to depict her during her bath years, when she would have been aged around 26 to 31 years old. Using source materials and forensic methods, Dring gave her the long nose and narrow mouth her siblings shared in, her, in their portraits, as well as the brunette hair with a rich color and the rosy cheeks, I would say maybe a little too rosy, um, she was described as having by people who had known her in life. She is also portrayed wearing her cap, which her nephew Edward described as a garb of middle age and unmarried status that both she and her sister Cassandra adopted before he considered their years really required. To drink, this sounds a touch old maidenish, but we can read it differently as a symbol of defiance. After the early death of her fiance, Cassandra had allegedly vowed to never marry anyone. And according to various accounts, this was the final nail in the coffin of Austin's at best half-hearted efforts to get married. Austin's decision to remove herself from the marriage market when she would have been expected to marry and her dedication to her writing and writing for profit on top of that, when as indicated by her nephew's portrayal of her, her priorities as a genteel woman were expected to lie elsewhere, demonstrates a lack of concern for patriarchal expectations that is nothing if not subversive. Wearing a mischievous look that Dring purposely meant to contrast with the most serious one in Cassandra's sketch, this brings to mind the Austen that at age 37 wrote in her letters. By the by, as I must leave off being young, I find many dessers in being a sort of chaperone, for I am put on the sofa near the fire and can drink as much wine as I like. Depicted here with her writing desk, Austen is portrayed first and foremost as a writer. Fifteen years later, as part of the celebrations for the 200th anniversary of Austen's death, we get a long overdue statue of Austen in Basingstoke, made by local art artist Adam Roud. Having lived for 25 years of her life in Steventon in the Hampshire country, countryside before her father's retirement and the family's move to Bath, Austin frequently visited the nearest town of Basingstoke. In this life-size statue, the fierceness in her eyes from Cassandra's portrait is back. Austin's contribution to literature represented by the book she holds under her left arm. This Austin is intent on something, in motion, holding her coat so that it doesn't impede her walking, the determination in her eyes matching that of her implied movement. As the artist Adam Rout explained while his work on the statue was still ongoing, I don't want her on a plinth. I plan to have her just walking in the street so that we are walking with her. We don't have to look very hard, however, to find very different portraits of Austin. As an author of pretty much incomparable popularity, except for, I reluctantly grant you, Shakespeare, Austen is very much an exception to the rule. 
while the work of many canonical Romantic period British authors is still approached with solemnity, Austen fans have completely punctured the idea that this is the only way to go. Instead, Austen is the perfect example of the benefits of approaching a canonical author from a place of humor and laughter. Considering authors of this period through the lens of humor is very much in the spirit of the Romantic Ridiculous Project, as part of which I worked with Andrew McInnes at Edgehill University. Having moved to Liverpool to work as part of this project, I got a welcome present from my colleague, Laura Eastlake, in the form of an Austen portrait. And you have to allow me a little bias when I say that this is my favorite Austen portrait of all. Sitting comfortably across a yellow couch, Austen wears a character characteristic cap, but also bright blue and pink socks as she takes a break from unpacking her books with a bucket of popcorn. This would be the first time I would ever really live by myself and the joy in this, I think, is perfectly encapsulated in Austen's self-assured smile. Other less personal, but also very fun modern depictions of Austen reflect the ways in which he has been reimagined for today's modern audience, particularly young people. The number of recent young adult novels that reimagine Austen's works, particularly her most popular one, Pride and Prejudice, such as Alice Oseman's Solitaire, Ibi Zuboy's Pride, and more recently, Nikki Payne's Pride and Protest, as well as new media series such as the Lizzie Bennet Diaries and Emma Approved for YouTube, make Austen's novels accessible to young people in new and engaging ways. As a result, we have seen the appearance of new portraits of Austen that reflect the humorous ways in which audiences approach her and her work today. There is an Austen action figure, which comes with a book, Pride and Prejudice, of course, and removable quill pen. Dressed in pink and white, Austen is wearing her characteristic cap. I don't currently uh, own one of these, and yes, I very much want to change this as soon as possible. Austen also has her own Funko Pop figure, this time in a blue dress, but also with her cap. I'm a big fan of this figure, having even used to publicize the publication of my first book, which was on Austen. This figure is very much a nod to one of the versions of James Andrews's watercolor in which Austen is depicted in a dress of the same color. In her hands, she holds a copy of Pride and Prejudice in a navy blue tone and decorated with a peacock feather, a reference to the famous 1894 peacock edition of Pride and Prejudice illustrated by Hugh Thompson. Austen does join, uh, joins the diverse group of authors who have their own Funko Pops, which includes Bram Stoker, Stephen King, and Edgar Allan Poe. If having a figure with an oversized head done to your likeness, marketed to a wide audience, isn't a sign that you've reached a peak in your level of fame, I don't know what is. Other portraits will seem more unfamiliar. French artist Pilar, Pilari has taken inspiration from the same version of James's Andrews's watercolor in a way that I've never seen before. Surrounded by flowers and her quill pen, Austen is wearing not her cap, but a pointy witch's hat, and not a copy of Pride and Prejudice, but a book of shadows, clearly identified as such by the pentacle on the cover. The star and moon-shaped wind chimes add even more of a magical quality to the portrait. The decision to portray Austen in this manner is an incredibly interesting one, fitting with the establishment of an association between literary, literary women and witches, such as, for example, in the Literary Witches Oracle designed by Tazia Kitaiskaya and Katie Horan. But why witches? From the days of the Salem trials to our own period, witches have always been a symbol of both female power and female persecution, as well as feminist resistance. As Christian J. Soleil argues, the contested identities of feminist and witch are informing generations of young women in our present time as they counter a history of misogyny with empowerment. In this sense, millennial women's growing interest in the figure of the witch, in particular the renewed associations of feminism and witchcraft, would constitute a form of resistance to patriarchy and consequent misogyny that women continue to face today. The establishment of a link between a classic author like Austen and witchcraft would therefore be part of a wider association between Austen and feminism, 
As an Austin scholar, I definitely see Austin as a feminist, as do other experts before me, such as Devaney Lauser. This is by no means a particularly niche position to take. Zuboy, the author of the YA novel Pride, a Pride and Prejudice, Prejudice remix, mentions Austin in her acknowledgments, writing, Austin gifted us a, with a story not only about love and class, expectations, and a woman's place in the world, even as she, a woman in 19th century England, had the audacity to write, observe, and speak true to power with such wit, humor, and grace. In this way, Zuboy recognizes the relevance that Austen's literary work continues to hold for younger generations who have seen any expectations for an equalitarian society, both in terms of gender equality and social equality, unfulfilled. Acknowledging Austen's novels as works that spoke true to power in their depictions of gender and class, constituting a form of resistance to an oppressive system links Austen to another perhaps unexpected figure, the resistance fighter from Star Wars. In artist Kelly Light's sketch of Austen, she is depicted wearing her cap, loose lockets of hair flowing in the wind as she stands ready to fight with her blue lightsaber. Most commonly wielded by Jedi guardians, those who represent the light side in a moral fight between the light and the dark side of the force, the blue color of the lightsaber symbolizes Austin's righteousness. More significantly, it associates Austin with the resistance, the group in the Star Wars universe that opposes the First Order, a military dictatorship that poses a threat to democracy in the galaxy. This portrait therefore associates Austin with good and empowerment, placing her alongside such formidable female characters in the Star Wars universe as Princess Leia and Rey, who inspire rebellion amongst others. In these more recent, more humorous portraits of Austin, we see in many ways a return to the woman Cassandra was portraying in her original sketch of her sister, someone who is willful, self-assured, and whose piercing eyes and defiant pose can be seen as an invitation to rebellion. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. I can stand my feet that I am. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Uh, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't find a better way to end uh, your Austin presentation than uh, with an Austin, a Star Wars, Star Wars Austin. I think that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm not going to be, uh, unfortunately, so, uh, you know, so exotic. However, I am the next speaker and I'm going to keep you in uh, similar territory as I am about to talk about um, Francis Bernie. So my name is Francesca Saggini. I am uh, um, a professor in English literature at the Università della Tuscia in Italy. And currently I am a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Edinburgh with a research project on reimagining romantic drama um, um, for new audiences. As the author and editor of several volumes, my research interests include adaptation studies, the Gothic and the forms of popular fiction from a transmedia perspective. I think you, may, you might have guessed it, considering the, the slant of the seminar. Uh, my monograph, The Gothic Novel in the Stage, Romantic Appropriations, received an honorable mention in the category Literatures in the English Language, Senior Scholars, awarded by the European Society for the Study of English. And recently, I edited the collection Francis Bernie and the Arts. So I'm going to start screen sharing, and here we go. I hope this is just going to be. Fine, there I am. Okie dokie. Right, so that should be the other way around. Present slide. Right, so um, this afternoon's chat will take us in a conversation around the high and popular arts in relation to Francis Bernie from the splendid halls of the National Portrait Gallery in London, the institutional place for excellence to celebrate artists and notables on canvas and in photo, to a pub with happy hours and live music in the south side of the capital, passing through writers, both famous and less so, celebrities and inspired street artists. 
In the next few minutes, I shall take Francis Bernie as my case study in order to explore how important an author space is for marketing as well as literary canon formation. I will consider how the publishing industry often resorted as much in the past as it does today to commodifying the author image to improve sales and kindle a comforting relationship of familiarity uh, between authors and readers. And finally, I shall reflect on why the association of a book Within, with an author space can improve sales. What story, either secret or overt, does an author's portrait tell us? So here we go. During 2020, when we were, when everybody was in hard lockdown, I contacted Surrey History Center to organize research activities related to the places in Surrey where Francis Bernie lived in the 1790s. Out of my frequent conversations with Julian Pooley, public services and engagement manager at the center, there came the idea of establishing a collaboration between local researchers, interested non-academic parties, and my project on Francis Bernie at the University of Edinburgh. When my suggestion for collaboration was taken up, Julian mentioned that it would also be nice to include a portrait of Bernie in the poster for my talk. So, Julian asked, is there a portrait that was taken around the time Francis Bernie was associated with Surrey, and will it be okay to use it? Apart from a couple of miniatures and a few artifacts of still doubtful attribution, including the miniature portrait by John Bobo, which claims the greatest credit for authenticity, the only known German likenesses of Francis Bernie are the two oils painted by her cousin, Edward Francis or Edward Francisco Bernie, held respectively in the private collection at Parham Park in Sussex and the National Portrait Gallery in London. Both have been given white currency on the frontispieces and the covers of many works written by or about Francis Bernie. Chances are that you may have come across either one or both yourselves. Most of the artwork, either indisputable or attributed, dates from the early 1780s, when Bernie's success had reached its peak, also at the international level, following the publication of Evelina in 1778 and Cecilia in 1782. Our first two, and actually <laughs> and only two, blockbusting novels, translated into various languages, including French, by the end of the century. The first of Edward Francisco's two portraits uh, was most likely painted in August 1782, only a, a month after Cecilia's publication. Ladies' Fashion provides a name for this portrait, called the Van Dyck portrait, because of the type of gown worn by Francis, commonly known as the Van Dyck dress. Bernie's diaries recount how the sitting came about, emphasizing on the one hand, the familial commission and future limited circulation of the artwork, and on the other, the unease felt by the apparently unwilling sitter, Francis Bernie. The instant dinner was over, she writes, to my utter surprise and consternation, I was called into the room appropriated for Edward and his pictures and informed that I was to sit to him for Mr. Crisp. Remonstrances were unavailing and declarations of aversion to the design were only ridiculed. Both daddies interfered and when I ran off, brought me back between them and compelled my obedience. Here, Bernie's somewhat overemphasized reluctance finds linguistic expression in the sequence of verbs in the passive form and in the slightly unlikely description of the machination she is the helpless victim of. The abhorrence for the picture sitting imposed upon her and her visible disinclination turn, an almost, uh, turn into an almost comic ambush of which she is the helpless victim. The second portrait of Francis Bernie that most people are familiar with is another all on canvas painted by Edward Francisco Bernie uh, circa 1785. Possibly building on the momentum of uh, Cecilia's international celebrity status that I mentioned earlier, this likeness is by far the visual representation of Bernie most people will think of. 
At the time of my email conversation with Surrey History Center, little did I know that I would, it would be possible to use that well-known portrait held at the National Portrait Gallery for free for non-commercial purposes. So I decided to launch an image search on Creative Commons, an immense online repository that holds over 6 million items to reuse. Never did I think that I was about to discover a portrayal of Frances Burney that was completely unknown to me. There she was. My internet search brought before my incredulous eyes the spirit of Edward Francisco's much loved versions of Frances. Her familiar intense look and half smile were unchanged, yet this time her still recognizable features had been given an appealing street vibe and were crowned in the ultimate pop twist with a strikingly mustard yellow mane. Past the first surprise, I wanted to find out right away more about this eye-catching artwork and its authors, whom the credit line indicated as idiom. I discovered that the Bernie mural had been painted in the beer garden of the Mere Scribbler pub, a pub in Streatham, a locality in southwest London with strong ties to the Bernies. In the summer of 1788, Frances had been introduced by her father, the musicologist and aspiring socialite, Dr. Charles Burney, into the circle of fine wits and famous artists regularly welcomed in the grand country home of the wealthy brewer, Henry Thrale, and his brilliant wife, Hester Lynch, at Streatham Park. There is no doubt that the multi-talented Hester was the powerhouse behind those trend-setting gatherings and the stimulating conversation they fostered. As a result, the conversion of Hester Lynch Thrale's refined 18th century salon into a busy pub in present-day London immediately struck me as quite unique, a deeply fascinating transformation. Without further ado, I contacted the artist duo behind this extraordinary mural, Idiom, or if you prefer, I-D-I-O-M. As they explained, Idiom made contemporary multimedia art with a street and pop edge. A very good example is given by the Bernie mural, Idiom versus the mere scribbler, the, Im the image we use for the posters of my Surrey talks. A mural which they spray painted in April, uh, 2017 for, for the reopening of the pub. The first thing I would like to bring to your attention is the name chosen for the renovated pub, the Mere Scribbler, which I found interesting in its own right. Who is the Mere Scribbler? Does the name refer to Francis Burney, the subject of, of the mural with pride of place in the pub garden? And what does this choice entail from a critical standpoint? We all know that the almost ludicrous disparagement of women writers as mere scribblers was widespread and biting when Francis Burney started to publish. It seems to me that by choosing the harshly gendered and heavily judgmental mere scribbler for the name of a pub, which is ultimately a commercial enterprise thriving on trade and profit-making business, those instances of long ago authorly vilification and the allegations of female amateurism were impertinently turned on their head by those 21st century publicans. In fact, in my very partial eyes, past denigration seemed to have been converted into a present day badge of professional commitment and shrewd self-management pinned onto Francis Burney's lapel from across the century. So now, what about Francis Burney, the supposed mere scribbler, an idiom? As they explained, idiom hardly knew anything about Francis Burney's life and work before they were commissioned the mural. Interestingly, most of the information they drew together was retrieved through a simple, no fuss internet troll. This basic search was apparently enough to make them aware that Francis Burney had strong connections with the area through the thrills of Streatham Park. This modern day connection between Stradham, the mere scribbler, pop and Francis Burney by way of street art immediately struck me as rather cheeky as Burney's then hostess, Hester Lynch Thrale, was just as famous as Burney was. In fact, Hester Lynch had a more established cultural profile as a woman about town than Francis's, 
when the two ladies met for the first time in the summer of 1778. We can see Hester here at the peak of her celebrity and reputation as a wit and a beauty in the well-known well portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, most of us remember her for. We could safely say that Hester was actually the hostess, the hostess with the mostest, so to speak. And I wonder if she now will be turning in her grave out of jealousy. Fanny King had a mural and she never did. Ostensibly, when they set out in their task, artist duo Idiom were not aware that only very few portraits of Francis Burney exist. As they confessed, they did their best with a not better defined portrait of Bernie they found while browsing the internet. Likely, this portrait must have been the Van Dyke gown one, as shown by some of their discarded designs. However, Idiom admitted that during their virtual trolls, they had come across the so-called balloon hat portrait as well. The creative overlapping of the two Bernie portraits, the Van Dyck on the one hand and the balloon hat on the other, is reflected in the various mock-ups for the final mural that you see in the slides. Whichever the sources of inspiration Idiom tapped into, I'm sure that Bernie would be quietly chuffed at being the grand centerpiece in a beer garden on a wall from which she can keep a discreet eye on all the action much as she did for a good part of her life, if I may add, by enjoying the role of the silent spectator, as she writes in a famous letter dated 1779. Such a speech as this would have determined me to dance, but it is so long since I have exhibited that I am a cool throne. Besides, I see plainly I should be watched and commented upon in a most scrutinizing manner. And therefore, I think I am most safe, and I know I am most easy in resting a quiet spectator. With Bernie's in action plan still firmly in mind, and with the help of the slide here, I hope that the symbolic layers I perceive in idiom versus the mere scrib scribbler start to emerge a bit more easily. Here on the beer garden wall is a gigantic Francis keeping an eye on or quietly spectating, as we could say by picking up the previous diary entry, the social hubbub unfolding in front of her in today's miniature version of 18th century London society. From her static side position, this oversized Francis looks curious, sympathetically interested, her gaze sweeping directly across the outside sitting area of the pub. Idiom were kind enough to share with me several mock-ups for the Mere Scribbler mural. And this slide shows my favorite one. You may judge for yourself whether the real foliage for hair would have been a striking or rather an out of place choice. Maybe you prefer the final yellow haired version of Bernie, Idiom eventually settled on. Personally, I found the idea of real ivy for hair so beautiful and evocative. And it is with a few closing words on this never to be mock up of the Burney mural that I shall finish off tonight. As they explained, since the mural is in the beer garden of a pub, Idiom wanted a striking centerpiece that would grab the customer's attention. And indeed, foliage for hair is definitely attention grabbing stuff. I think we all agree here. If I may, however, I would add as a footnote to Idiom's disclaimer, a comment on, Ber on the Bernie Surrey link. Francis Bernie was a city or a London girl, if you prefer, for most part of her youth. However, when she moved to Surrey, a married woman well in her 40s by then, she kind of adopted a more environmentalist or greener perspective. Her Surrey stay in the 1790s was under the sign of gardening, country walking, enjoying the local be natural beauties in company of her would-be horticulturalist husband, as much as it was about deeply committed professional writing. Frankly, I'm sorry that Idiom, uh, Idiom's uh, ivy hair portrait never happened. It would have paid a fitting homage to what I consider an extraordinary face in Bernie's life. I also like the fact uh, that Idiom painted the mural around a wall socket. 
Probably it is a socket used to plug in a hoover or a similar machine to clean the beer garden. And obviously it was included in the picture out of necessity rather than artistic choice. However, this coincidence seems utterly fitting to me. When Frances Bernie lived in Surrey, she really got powered up, charged up, so to speak, motivated by the responsibility of financially supporting her growing family. By drawing inspiration from idioms Ivy uh, Bernie mock-up then, I would only have jokingly referred to Surrey Bernie as E Bernie, electric Bernie. Amid Surrey's Georgic landscape, on the surface so distant from the business atmosphere of London, Frances Bernie defiantly started writing for profit. She became the breadwinner in the household, determined to capitalize on what she could still command of her former novelistic fame. In less than a decade, Bernie composed three dramas, a novel, lots of creative stuff she meant to put out in the world. She even built a house, Camilla Cottage, with the money she made from the subscription for her Surrey novel, Camilla, or a picture of youth. So the ivy and the electricity, to me, these two elements perfectly represent my idea of Bernie in Surrey. Bernie's past and present portraits, now gracing Parham House in Sussex, the National Portrait Gallery in London, as well as a lively music pub in Streatham, powerfully remind us that any portrait implies, and in fact, it actually solicits not a mere one-way gaze, but a complex two-way gaze. While the viewer looks at the, at the portrait, the sitter implicitly looks back at as much as looks out for the viewer too. By examining her various images, we the viewers create stories around Francis Bernie, the writer. As much as Francis Bernie, the writer sitter, spins her own yarn for the benefit of us, the viewers, from within the frame. Thus two stories, hers and ours, coexist with and complement each other. After all, a portrait is both a narrative of the self and by the self, especially so, and perhaps more eloquently so, when the portrait is a writer. Thank you. That's that. I should be able to stop sharing. That's it. Oh, thank you very much, Dita. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So that's us. That's the end uh, of tonight's uh, seminar. I'm happy to say that we have about uh, 25 minutes for questions and answers. So, so I think that I'll have a look and see. All right, there are some comments. Um, so first of all, it's Cassie, I think. Uh, I think that Cassie was making a reference to what I said about Esther Trail being uh, unhappy of the fact that Frances Bernie had a mural and she never had. And Cassie comments, uh, Hester Thrale would be absolutely fuming. Yes, quite right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can bet. Uh, I wonder if uh, there are any questions uh, from uh, um, uh, from the audience. You can raise your hand. Yes, Cassie. And um, anybody else? Right. I think that's Cassie's first. Uh, hi, Fan. Yeah, thank you. I mean, as you know, like obviously we've talked about that piece before um, and I really enjoyed all of your papers, actually. And it, it kind of, sorry, I'll put my hand down first so that I don't forget to do it later. Um, yeah, so I'm partly prompted by my just thinking about how Hester Piotzi would react and going, well, you know, all the misses have got a mural in a pub and why can't I have a mural in a pub? Because they're all doing it. <laughs> um, but I also thought there's something really interesting about... Um, what she jealous what would in my hypothetical scenario that i'm now wondering if we can get funded to somehow be like animated um like what is the kind of um capital that she would be envious of because i feel like in some ways the way these images are being used later on are, could be seen as exploitative and i'm thinking particularly um of valentina's paper as well the kind of exploitation of image and you know bernie's being used there for commercial purposes in a way that like I feel like, yeah, you're right about the positioning, but in another way, like, 
I'm not sure how she would have felt about that level of visibility being used to promote a pub, a kind of a social space in which she was the focus. Um, so I think um, from one point of view, like, it's, I think we really can gain loads of really um, kind of positive and kind of empowering messages from these images. But also, like, it comes back to the essential problem of, like, the embodied writer and, and that as a commercial product. So um, I wondered if any of you would like to talk about that as an issue. I don't know if Rita and Valentina want, uh, want to start off. You have uh, an answer? Um, well, I think for, I mean, for the case of what I was talking about, it's, it is kind of interesting because... Um, there are so one reason why I focused on coins, coins and notes and stamps is because there are so many like remakings of lower tours, like existing pictures. And many of them are like really great. Some of them are kind of quite ugly or just like strange. Um, and I think, um, you know, I guess in the case of Lower Tour, the political use of his image was already something that was happening during his life. So maybe there is a um, a kind of in him also reluctance to, you know, not be really portrayed. Not that we know that he he would have sat for any portraits. Um, so yeah, and I think there there is. There is an exploitation of the image, but also simultaneously um, a form of affirmation in the case of, for example, Haiti as a country to have a figure like Toussaint in the money um, as a form of affirming themselves as a legitimate institution that would be kind of reaffirming of his message. So I think, yeah, in that sense, that, that would be my thought about that. I don't know about the rest. Rita, do you have any thoughts you want to share? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really uh, glad that you asked that because that actually fits into um, a, a question that I had for Valentina. Because um, I was, which you just answered very well. I was going to ask, you know, um, uh, because it seems that um, the two people we're talking about share a common element, which is that we have a difficulty, as you were saying, in pinning down what they would have looked like. Um, which means that they end up being represented in bills in, um, mm -hmm. you know, arguably yeah. weird ways. And I didn't, I, I, I kind of didn't mention the, the Austin bill because um, it's, it's been talked about a lot and I felt like I was just going to rant about it. Um, <laughs> But um, but but I, I was going to ask you, which like like I said, you answered very well. You know, how do you think this influences the ways that we think of them? And that same um, those two sides to it that you talked about, I very much share them. It's like on one hand, uh, I'm very happy that Austin was in the ten pound pound note. I mean, it's well overdue for someone like mm -hmm. her to 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 be there, and it did it did kind of bring. It almost I felt like it almost legitimized what I what I did by by being like, look, you know, this is someone that you should know about. Yeah. Um, so on in many ways, I, I was very happy about that. On the other one, I felt like anyone who knows anything about Austin would have designed <laughs> a better a better bill. You know, it was very problematic. The kind of portrait of her is is really softened. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it has a quote about reading that's completely taken out of context. Um, the house that is shown in the background is a brother's house, and it's not at all a, a reflection of the reality of what her living life would have been like. Um, so, yeah, so I absolutely, you know, share this kind of ambivalence with you where it's like on one hand mm -hmm. positive, on the other hand, you know, kind of problematic. So, yeah, thanks for that question, Cassie. Well, I would like to add uh, something as well, and I think it's a very, very interesting question, uh, that, this question and a good point that Cassie made. Um, whenever I made that comment about uh, uh, Hester Lynch, uh, I was thinking in particular of um, the Streatham years, because obviously I don't think that uh, Mrs. Streatham would have been uh, very interested in being made a centerpiece in a pub or in a similar a salon or something like that whenever 
after she became a widow, uh, after Piozzi died. And in fact, if we have a look at um, her, um, her letters, there is a frontispiece where Mrs. Piozzi is wearing her widow uh, robes and uh, she's completely um, unglamorous compared to the former um, uh, Reynolds portrait. However, I think uh, is a very fine divide between uh, um, how to make an author accessible and make it part of the public's everyday life and everyday's imagination and to keep uh, an author away from some kind of commercial exploitation. I think that with Bernie, we are at a stage where there is a lot of interest going on. And if that means that um, becoming more commercial and even being exploited, uh, that uh, to me, that is, um, you know, is a step worth taking for two reasons. First of all, because frontispieces with the author's faces have always been uh, um, a way to improve sales. So the author image has, has been uh, uh, commodified uh, um, since, shall we say, the very beginning of the 19th century. And then another thing is that I have found uh, um, a lot of other modern portrayals of Francis Bernie I was not aware of, including comic books which I'm going to be discussing possibly in a, in a, in a, in a different, uh, um, at a different time. And I think it's interesting that a lot of this work is completely unknown, but it is there. So it is feeding some kind of creative urge and it's also feeding some kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's looking at um, uh, a possible um, audience interest as well. So I think it's a very fine line uh, between exploitation and uh, celebration. And I would like uh, to go for celebration at the point we are at in Bernie studies. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes, let's have a look. Cassie. Uh, again, right. Oh, first of all, Matthew. Right. Uh, Matthew, do you want to uh, speak up? You want to ask your question or make your point uh, in, in person? It was only a comment, really. I would make yes. a question in a moment. Right. Uh, do you want to read out your comment? It's just it's better to hear your own voice. It makes a wee bit more, you know. Oh, it's just, it was just, it reminded me of the sort of the Auden poem about Yeats, where he talks about what happens after Yeats dies and how he becomes the, he becomes his admirers. So like sort of, this weird way that we transform authors after they die into aspects of ourselves. And I was thinking about Rita's contemporary Austins in particular, that we want an Austin who looks more like us, whoever us is, and that creates this sort of amazing gallery of different kinds of Austins infused with things that she would have, would have had no way of encountering and may or may not have approved of. Um, yeah, so it was really, I mean, I wonder whether this is in some ways inevitable if authors are going to are going to live on that they get sort of reappropriated and put into different frames. I guess the the alternative is the sort of period drama frame but that always is an imposition of our ideas of, of what their history looks like rather than a, a or it's very rarely a hugely accurate um, curation of history. So if I may just jump in very quickly just to pick up uh, Matt's point which I think is is very very interesting. Sometimes uh, this kind of um, memorialization um, becomes a happens uh, during the author lifetime. For instance, I have uh, put together an incredible large number of images of Alfred Tennyson used uh, for commercial purposes. For instance, in calendars, it was a calendar boy. And uh, you would have never thought of Tennyson as part, uh, you know, in, in, in a calendar, but it gives you an idea that people were referring to Tennyson as a household name, and they wanted to have to appropriate Tennyson and have Tennyson as very similar to what happened to Burns as well in their everyday life. So, oh, it was son, somebody, uh, Valentina says, yeah. was, son was also in a revolution in calendar yeah. 1945. <laughs> so, there are a lot of calendar boys here. <laughs> Make your point, Valentina. You want to take um, this up? Yeah, it kind of is related. Uh, to, to what Matt was saying, what you were saying, and it's a question that I had for Rita. Um, 
and it's kind of a little bit outside of what you were talking about so I'm sorry if this kind of no, puts you on the spot but yeah I was wondering if you have read, read any of these like remakes of um of Austin because it's kind of interesting how there's a relationship with the author and also with the books right so when they remake say you know someone loves Austin but also wants to like do this kind of spin-off I don't know how to call it I'm sorry um That's this it. like remake of of Jane Austen like what is shared is it like the narrative is it the narrative style is it like the types of personalities of the characters what remains in them is my question um so I will confess myself to be a huge fan of them so <laughs> amazing we <laughs> guess that much Lita <laughs> Um, huge I'm uh, th this is my this is one of my hobbies I review them for my YouTube channel I, I have a great oh. time with it and um, it, it's a great question and, and I mean the answer is that it really really varies um, mm -hmm. so the last one that, that I reviewed uh, I, I showed was one uh, one of the ones I was in the picture and was Pride and Protest by Nikki Payne and this is um, the conflict between uh, between the Elizabeth character and the Darcy character is that he's the CEO uh, of a company who is trying to build basically an affordable condos in her neighborhood. And the book becomes about gentrification mm -hmm. uh, in really interesting ways. And I think it's really fun to see the things that the authors are like, mm, I'm not, this doesn't quite fit into my story mm -hmm. uh, from the original novel, but then in other ways, how closely like some scenes and the themes that are discussed in them really mimic like what happened in the what happened in the original ones and mm -hmm. I think this that, that one Pride and Protest is a really interesting example because it shows that many of the things that Austin was saying about gender and class so about um expectations that I that are put on you because you're a woman or because you're a, a person of a certain class um, are still really, really relevant today. And to that, uh, Nikki Payne adds the, um, the element of race, mm -hmm. um, which, which is lacking in, in the original Pride and Prejudice. So I think that just makes it her own. So in mm -hmm. many ways, it's, um, it's a great, I call them reimaginings just because I like the word. Mm -hmm. I think you can call them a myriad of other things. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it, it makes it a, a really good reimagining of Pride and Prejudice because it shows that so many of the things Austin were, were, was talking about are still relevant to our period mm -hmm. today, but also um, it's a novel in its own right that is also making, you know, additional, additional points. But, you know, mm -hmm. I've also read uh, novels uh, that focus on Mary Bennett, where she becomes a spy for the government. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I read one where there was a time traveling bonnet. This was a reimagining <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. I mean, it's I, I I think they're great. I love them, and I I'm all for this kind of democratization where um, where people can take Austin and kind of and kind of run with it. Can I uh, ask a follow up for that? Uh, just um, very briefly. Do are there like I surely there are like others where Austin is a character like or like kind of fan fiction I don't know is that fan fiction I am no no expert but yeah uh -huh. yeah anyway um, yeah I that there aren't that many of those that I know one that comes to mind is uh oh my god I have it right there it's uh, Miss Austin. I forget the name. Jill, I forget the last name. But uh, but it basically focuses uh, on Cassandra Austin, and mm -hmm. it's a, a, an um, imagining uh, Cassandra's experiences of so many things that we know only through Austin's Austin's letters, oh. mainly. So that one is a really interesting one. Uh, the the ones that I can think of out of the top of my head, because I also really like those two, are in uh, <laughs> TV and film. So mm -hmm. Miss Austin Regrets is a really interesting one, uh, which basically, uh, I mean, it has like Olivia, Olivia Williams playing Austin and she's my favorite actress and that's my favorite role anyone has ever <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, and it's basically focusing on Austin as an aunt 
Um, uh-huh. And also the question of whether she would have regretted marrying or not. And that one is a great one. And I mean, it will always simplify uh, things to a certain extent. Yeah. So it's focused around, did she regret getting married? So it's focused on that very particular aspect of her life. So of course, it's going to be a little reductive in some ways, um, but also really, really great in others. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I would recommend that one. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Any more questions? All oh, right, Kelsey here. Kelsey, do you want to read out your question yourself? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm cooking risotto over here, so apologies for <laughs> that on and off. Bless you. <laughs> you <please> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, um, I don't know if anyone else remembers, like obviously Paula Byrne wrote that wonderful book about Austin, um, but she also has this portrait that she says she thinks is Jane Austen, and there was a whole program about it. It's a long time since I saw it, but I feel, and I'm now trying to remember, was it was it Deirdre Le Fay that they interviewed? Or they interviewed a prominent Austen scholar who was like, no, can't be, can't be, can't be. And I don't, I, I don't think I have necessarily a view on this, but I think that's a really interesting moment in like port, like portraiture and kind of fan cultures. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that, um, if that comes up at all in your research or, yeah. But, but also any of you, if, if you kind of know about this portrait, I'd love to know what you think. Okay, this is the next thing I'm doing after this because I haven't. Oh. It came up while I was while I was researching this paper, and and I purposely did not mention it because I was like, oh, did not know. I read about it. I remember reading the book, and I agree, it's a fabulous book. I love Paula Byrne as an author, um, but I and and at the time I was like, okay, this sounds convincing, and I didn't know about the controversy, so I was like, okay, I need to go out and read this and if I uh, and I, I remember Deidre Lefe very fondly like I, I spent a week with her at Shorten House Library and I remember at the time her saying I am interested in the facts and only the facts so I remember that for Deidre anything that you couldn't factually check with certainty it wasn't something that um that she was interested in so i I really want to watch this. I really, really do. So I will get back to you on this. Can I um, right. share? Argentina, you again. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just no, about it's fine. It's fine. Kind of a related effect that, so because we don't know who how to sand looked, occasionally there are like new portraits, like 1790s portraits of a black man in a military uniform that people start claiming is to sand. Ooh. And that's like a very kind of, you know, everyone comes out with a new engraving of Toussaint that nobody had seen. And there's, I just would like to share very briefly, there's this painting that appeared in, was being oh. sold at Christie's in 2011. And it is it is in fact the picture for Wikipedia in English for Toussaint. But this is, I'm sorry, I, this is my note. It says implausible. <laughs> <laughs> but um it was people started claiming that it was possibly to sand and saying that it was a 1790s painting even though there's like no evidence they came up with a possible painter but it doesn't really fit the signature down here so it has now been discarded but at some point if you look it up the, and it's still on wikipedia it says uh, was, was this the actual face of Toussaint, even though he also doesn't look like any of the other Toussaints that we really know at all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, it happens with people, especially if we don't know the likeness very well, that um, everyone wants to claim that they found the final, you know, real picture, um, which is exciting, but also, um, oh, I, yeah. I love this. Um, has something like that happened with Bernie or not really? Well, well, I think uh, I was actually thinking that um, before uh, the National Portrait Gallery, the so-called balloon hat um, uh, was, um, was purchased uh, by the National Portrait Gallery, uh, it was very difficult to find, uh, to have access to Bernie, Bernie's portraits. And today I was having a look at something that was published in the 1920s. And they wanted to include a portrait of Bernie. It, it, it's, a, it's a book which is not only about Bernie, but Bernie is discussed in it. And they wanted to use a portrait. They wanted to add a face to the name. And although they used uh, something which is totally, it's not Bernie at all, 
and I don't know where they came from, which I am going to investigate. I, I just came across it today. I, I still feel that uh, a lot of people would like to associate a face with a text. Mm -hmm. So whenever we have, you know, the, the, we have the 1960s disappearance of the author, Barthes, Foucault and all that, and on the other hand, there is this craving to have a face, to have a body, to have a life associated to that text. So the, it's not only text, it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of author as well. And I think we're actually running out of time. So um, I would like to know if there is any other final quick uh, Oh, I can think of any pictures of an elderly Bernie, <laughs> unlike Piozzi. No, there are no pictures uh, that I could, not, not even the, the very recent one I've been looking at. There's a lot of Bernie-related merchandise, believe it or not. So mm -hmm. I was happy to find out uh, that she's, she's slowly going the Austin way. I'm quite pleased to see that. And I would actually like to thank all the speakers uh, the audience who can, kindly waited until this ungodly hour, uh, the vast <laughs> digital events team, and possibly we could uh, end up uh, with some of Umberto Eco, um, a lecture in Fabula, I think it's called Reading for, a, for the Plot in English. And Eco says that every text is really uh, requires a reader as every text is waiting for a reader to actualize the meaning and the significance of the text. And possibly it is the very same with an author image. Every image really looks, uh, uh, requires a reader, requires a viewer, requires somebody who's going to develop its ghostly potential. So thank you very much. And I don't know if, uh, Matthew or anybody else has um, some final words to remind us of the next appointment? If not, um... I, will just, I will just appear and say thank you. Um, next event, uh, late April, which is the Romantic, um, which is Romanticism, Pedagogy and the Arts in Asia during the pandemic. Um, I put the link in earlier, I will find it again. But can I just thank uh, Fran and Valentina and Rita for three really fascinating papers. Use thank your you very much to your everybody. wine glass emotes as you. As you yes, so please. And, and if anybody is interested, oh, thank you very much. Um, I, if anybody is interested in carrying on this conversation, perhaps we could put together something like a book proposal or something like that that could develop, uh, you know, uh, romantic studies uh, uh, um, in, in a different visual and material culture direction. So get in touch and let's uh, keep the, the wine and the conversation flowing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks a Thank lot, you, everyone. Nice.